I titled this lecture Collaborative Coding. And one of the main takeaways, uh, I'll get into a little bit of actual coding uh, towards the end of the lecture, but one of the main takeaways that I want you all to get from this collaborative coding lecture is how to collaborate on GitHub. So GitHub is really the end all be all of coding. If you ever wanna be a developer, if you have any aspirations to that, GitHub is where you will live. Uh, it's where people discover talent. It's where teams are formed, companies are started and all of that. So I think the more fluent you can get in how that ecosystem works, the better suited you will be uh, to be able to navigate the web development world. So before we get into the thick of things, I, I'd love some of the teams to share their Scrum docs. Um, just curious to see what are some of the to-dos that you came up with. There, there's no real pressure here. Um, I, I just think it's helpful at this beginning stage for teams to see what the other teams have been working on. Um, and sometimes that can help for inspiration. So would anyone like to share first? Joanna, I know you showed your documents with me, so I know those look good. Um, so maybe you can start off by, by sharing with everyone what you all have come up with. I'll stop my share. Sorry, my computer is really laggy, so I can't pull it up while having Zoom open right now. Really? I, I can share it then, because I'm, I'm partners with Joanne. Awesome. Yeah, let's see that, Scott. Thanks, Scott. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. So yeah, this is our Scrum board. We put all of our user stories in and we're starting to write our functions to do. We're trying to make it a little more specific. So like when we talk about creating a table, um, we're gonna be doing that in HTML. So we're just, you know, it's a work in progress right now. Absolutely. and. What have you seen as maybe some of the, the biggest challenges that you're going to face moving forward? Um, definitely learning the coding, just because like I've never been exposed to like HTML before this class or anything like that. Um, and then also JavaScript. I've heard of JavaScript, but I've never worked with it. So, but I'm excited to, to learn. Great. And, and do you guys think from the, that initial meeting, do you have a good idea of what's going to be that first piece that you're going to want to tackle in, in terms of the product? You know, to be honest, not yet, um, but we are meeting. We just met today. We're also meeting later on in the week after this class um, to kind of- I think we mentioned- Sorry. Go ahead, Joanne. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, oh, we said that we were going to look into like um, go back into HTML and then look into like how to create a table and how that is maybe like our first um, thing to do. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Um, of course, let me know if there's anything I can help with. Uh, I think if there's enough demand for uh, tables, that can be one thing that I dive a little bit deep into and, and show you all how to code that similar to what I did with wireframes, I'm happy to do with coding. So great job, great start, and I look forward to seeing what you all come up with. All right, thank you. Who wants to go next? Maybe Maria? Okay, um, I didn't necessarily, my team met together, but we di I didn't know what to put on the scrum board. I think either Michael or Danny did, but I can go ahead and share what we currently have so far. And this is definitely at this point, it's not a competition at all. So I think <laughs> this is just helpful for people to see, I think what some of those initial discussions were. Yeah, so I think like we were initially confused as to what to put into the scrum board just because um, we weren't sure if this was like a to do list like, like, oh, Michael do JavaScript or whatever, or if we had to input like the functions that we were going to be putting. And mm -hmm. then 
actually like for example like um the log the login button right and then you would just put like the function to do is create the code the coding for that um i don't know maybe you can clarify please yeah absolutely so i i think right here as an example you you've got this payment method um now what we'll really want to focus on is the user experience so you might want to look back on some payment methods that you've seen in apps that you've really liked and that maybe that's lyft or uber or, or maybe it's venmo something like that and then basically just look at what are the aspects of that that you like whether it be the way that you enter your payment information the way that you choose when to pay something like that and then try to take some of those best practices and then put that onto your app so some of the to do's that that will translate to are things like, um, you know, let's create a an input box to input payment information, and then a button that presses OK. And then when you press that button, maybe a dialogue comes up that says processing your payment, something like that. Like you're not going to actually take payments uh, in, in your prototype. What you want is a user experience that will look nice, that will encourage people to want to you know, take that next step and, and understand how to take that next step. Sometimes I'm sure you've had that experience where you've had something you wanted or uh, may, maybe an app that you liked, but some aspect of it was so convoluted that you could never actually get to the point where you were using it. Um, so the point here is how can you come up with an easy user experience that will make it abundantly clear to them how they would, in this case, uh, secure their payment, but obviously do all the other aspects of your app too. Okay, but when we're creating the, like the the web page or like the application itself, do we just particularly focus on like one particular aspect, like we did in the, in the what is it called, like the, the thing that we presented, or do we focus on like the entire process of the user story? It's definitely, and this goes in line with the what is an MVP, right? It's you're you're trying to build a skateboard uh, to to get that you know if if the goal is to get from point a to point b build a skateboard don't try to build like the engine of a ferrari because you can't take an engine from point a to point b so um really it's focus in on that most fundamental part uh in your case it probably has something to do with how do you find out where the medication that you want is and then how do you call it to come to you you mm -hmm. know um and then understanding that that drones are not part of the, your offering, right? So you, you just want to build that interface that would be nice to use if there were drones out there that you had control over and, and someone would want to figure out how can they call that drone to go to their house. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. And this is this is kind of why I wanted you all to, to share because you know there's no great attached to this part. I, I just want to be able to get all of those little kinks out so that we, we can hit the ground running um as soon as possible cool okay who wants to go next i can go for alana and myself yes and alana feel free to jump in if you have anything else to add so for our scrum board um we wanted to kind of be able to break it up something by function so as a patient i want to be able to log into my device so that i can access my personalized documents so the function for us to be able to kind of do is to be able to learn how to be able to create and make a login device using HTML and other kind of formats. So that's what these two kind of documents are for. And then this is kind of just going back to our main point, which is as someone who wants to be able to make a difference in the healthcare industry, I would like to be able to kind of create a patient transportation service. So that is covered by insurance in order to be able to decrease barriers to healthcare access. So patients can receive the best possible treatment. This is probably our, our kind of our thesis and something that we're going to be able to keep on referring back to. And then we have other kind of documents for patients and for industry professionals. Great. And is there any particular aspect of this that you think is challenging or, or something that you'd like to bring up? I think for a lot of these kind of projects, we all have like some logins, login pages. So I think if you can kind of be able to help us navigate how to actually make a login page, at least just like how to do like a data input, like a very simple username, password, we can kind of be able to go from there. 
And then we were also thinking because some of it's also like we want to be able to introduce a map and put a map into our actual app. We didn't know exactly how to be able to go with that first step. Plus, if there's any way that we can kind of be able to see or mimic anything to be able to do with Uber, I don't know if there's any public like public data sources, public code for Uber and like how they actually use their display. Because uh, we had a kind of a general idea that it would be kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, those are great questions. Um, in terms of the map, I would say for now, and I'll show you how to put images into your app, is you can just use a static image that looks like the map that you would want to put in. Um, and then if we have time, I can show you how to use what's called an API, which is basically, it's a, a call that you make to Google uh, that basically asks Google to put their Google Maps onto your web page. So that, that could be a cool thing to, to work on maybe in the final week or two. Um, but in the meantime, what you'll be able to do is just put an image in that would basically be simulating that map, if that makes sense. And, and then in terms of logins, um, I do want to stay away from logins a little bit because uh, actually last year, a, a lot of the classes did logins. And well, that's all well and good. Um, I think it's better to just assume that everyone's logged in because the login is not really, um, it doesn't communicate the the unique function of the app, you know, because since every app has a login, um, I can show you a little bit of how that works, but I, I do want to make sure that you all are focusing on the unique features uh, of your app as opposed to um, the, the login process, because it can be a little bit tedious. And um, I, I think your time could be better spent on, on some of the more interesting features. Okay. Um, I actually have a question on our um, scrum board. Yes. So um, as you can, as you saw in our user stories, we have a few different perspectives, like from a patient's perspective, a developer's mm -hmm. perspective, an industry professional. So the one thing I was wondering is in regards to our point on an industry professional and trying to um, get patients to the site better, clinical sites easier. Um, I was trying to figure out specific functions for that. Is there anything you can think of off the top of your head? Um, you know, that, that that might be something in terms of getting people to a clinical site. Mm -hmm. th there are a few things that I could show you. Um, there, there's some location-based and, and some um, that, that are a little bit more just uh, you search like a disease area. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is the major, major one that every clinical site needs to register with clinicaltrials.gov. And um, they actually allow people to pull their information directly onto their platforms. So, so that can be one data source. Um, another data source that, that's a little bit more snazzy because clinicaltrials.gov is a pretty ugly site um, is Antidote. And Antidote, they style themselves as like the um, Travelocity uh, or Kayak um, for flights, but instead of for flights, they're for clinical trials. So th those would be two good benchmarks to take a look at. Okay, um, how about... Let's see, I don't see Tristan, but John? Yes, so uh, by default, I'll go over our scrum board. Uh, let's see. So ours was the podcast for physicians. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's the roles. Um, so we have these uh, few user stories. We wanted to really focus on, I guess, making it easy to use uh, because it's all about you know, having the podcast be accessible and like uh, all the categories or having like following particular podcasts for like what the healthcare professional is interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so as we go through it, it's pretty much, you know, we want uh, as users, we want to be able to watch podcasts uploaded by other users, browse the different categories and find podcasts based on those. Um, be a creator themselves, upload and share your podcasts and have like, you know, feedback as like comments or reviews, um, following other users or podcast producers. Um, and then I guess as we go further along, kind of like 
things that aren't part of like the MVP, but like having help for like, if you didn't know how to do any particular function um, about your account. Um, and then this was about following a particular podcast creator. Um, and then, yeah, these were related to earlier ones too. So those were just duplicates that we had, but that's Great. where we were starting off with. Excellent. And, and I like that you're focusing on usability um, because, you know, it, it would be difficult in this case. Um, and, and I think this shares a lot of similarities with the other projects to actually do the podcasting part, right? You're, you're not going to have a lot of podcasts or content to share. Even getting someone to listen might be difficult um, with the amount of time that we have. But what you can focus on is that user interface. It's what is the vision that you all have for this podcasting system and, and what are gonna be some of those initial elements that you're gonna to wanna to build to create that vision. So I, I think this is a good focus. I, I would say the next step, um, similar to how um, Scott mentioned that they, they were gonna be focusing on like building tables, is think about what, it, what is gonna be that initial thing that you're gonna to wanna to build into your HTML. And I'll show you some things uh, soon uh, about like grid layouts and things like that, that might be relevant for how you would lay out a podcasting app or, uh, you, know, you know, some of these other apps as well, it, it might be relevant. So I, I'm definitely going to be spending a lot of time in the coming lectures showing examples that hopefully will inspire you all of things that you can steal as concepts to incorporate into your apps. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, back to me. So thanks so much for sharing. Uh, like I said, this wasn't for a grade or anything. I think it's just helpful for everyone to see the different um, challenges as well as progresses that each other have made, because I think that helps align everyone in the right place. Um, and, and like I said, I, I'm available uh, Wednesdays, Fridays. And also, if you just email me, I can either be available to answer the email or, or we can figure out a time that might work with everybody's schedule. So just let me know. Uh, I'm definitely here to help. Okay, so a little bit of lecture. I want to talk about front end versus back end. So you all have learned a lot of HTML uh, and CSS. And I just want to talk about the overall ecosystem. So front end is basically, if we look at this analogy of the tip of the iceberg, front end is what the user can see. So this is what shows up on the screen. And, and actually, all front end code is um, you can take it from a site. Uh, all you have to do is right click that site and click view source. And you can see all of the front end code that is behind that website. Now, sometimes they jumble it up and, and make it look ugly, but for the most part, they allow you to see how they built their website. Um, and that includes HTML, CSS and JavaScript, which is basically all, all of the tools that you're gonna be learning. Backend, now JavaScript is actually a little bit of a, it leaps between front end and back end. Technically it's a front end language, but it can perform a lot of the back end tasks. And when we talk about back end, this is where a lot of the algorithms and databases exist. Um, we're not going to get too much into the back end stuff, but like I said, we're going to use JavaScript as a substitute for databases and as an engine for writing algorithms. And we'll get into a little bit of how to do that with JavaScript in the next lecture. But um, that's basically the line that people draw between front end and back end is front end is what you see, what the user sees. Back end is all of the stuff that sort of makes it happen. So a good example with Facebook is everything that you actually interact with, like where do you stick the photos and all of that, that's on the front end, but there are billions of users those are stored on a backend database. So they have to do a lot of algorithms that can quickly retrieve the right users, whether that be your friends list or people in a certain group very quickly, and then insert that into the front end uh, view. So usually what will happen is um, they'll have some sort of interface where let, let's say with Python, this is the Python symbol. Um, Python will make what's called a query to the backend database and then inject that data onto the HTML page. So the HTML will leave like little spaces that'll say, hey, this is a placeholder. 
where my backend code is going to insert the right information. Does that make sense? Sort of the difference between front end and back end. Any questions about that? Okay. Now within front end, we have HTML and CSS, and and I can speed through this a little bit because I know that you've been learning it, but HTML is sort of the structure of what ends up on the web page. And something that I'm going to go into a little bit today is you can structure all of your code within a head, a body, and then also footer, although that's used uh, much less often. The head is where you put a lot of the information gathering code, like I want to link this HTML with certain CSS, or I want to link it with certain JavaScript. So you, you do a lot of the linkages here, and then the body is where you actually put the content. So the body is where you would, you know, say like the title, the, the paragraph that you have beneath the title, that's where you would insert any images that you want to insert. So most of what you do is going to be within the body. And then, but if you were to look at a page without including the CSS, it's just going to be a bunch of words. So there's not going to be any formatting. It's just going to be black and white text. It's not going to be very informative or, or visual at all. CSS is what makes it look nice. So in this case, if I were to give some HTML content a class, let's say that class is man, then I could define within that class, in this case, hair equals brown, height equals 60 pixels, position standing that sort of thing. And we'll go into what that looks like, but I know you've learned that a little bit through your Code Codecademy. Um, so what they're doing is distinguishing between the structural layer, which is the content that is defined by HTML, and they're making it stylized. So they're, they're pre presenting the presentational layer. Then where does JavaScript fit in? So JavaScript is what makes our code a little bit more dynamic. So in this case, I've created this JavaScript button. So if I click this button, you can see it, it makes the icon spin. So th this is something that I, I think is gonna be very important for the end of, of this course is you should be able to create content that explains what you're trying to do uh, to the user, make that content look good using CSS, and then have a couple nifty functions using JavaScript. And again, I'll go through the next few lectures about how you can do that with JavaScript and what that might look like for your particular platforms. So talking a little bit about head. So there's a lot of mumbo jumbo that people put up in the head. Um, you can see that there's this meta char set UTF-8. This is just sort of things that help make sure that your code um, can get along well with your browser. So browsers need to know what kind of content are you putting into um, this code that you wanna show up on the page. And, and so this just helps you do that. Um, you can also put a title. So title is what might show up on the, uh, the tab within a browser. So if you look at, I'm sure all of the tabs that you have open, you can sort of pick out which tab is what because of what they put into this title section of the head. And then you can link out to all sorts of things. So you can link out to different CSS documents. You can link out to different JavaScript documents, basically whatever you need to make your code run the way that you want it to run. And, and we'll go into what that will look like for your projects later on in this lecture. Um, so this is, again, it's sort of meta info. Um, so it's how do you make sure that your code is talking to the um, browser in a way that is going to make the website show up the way that you want it to show up. You can also include things like Google Analytics, where if you put a little snippet of code that they actually just tell you to copy and paste into your web page, then Google can analyze how many users are going to your website, how long they're staying, things like that. Um, Facebook Open Graph is another cool thing where um, if you put information there, you can basically I don't know if you ever share like a news article uh, via Facebook or text or, or really any other platform. And sometimes it'll come along with like a little image of the article and, and a title and a little description. Um, that information is all done through this Facebook open graph uh, and that all that stuff goes in the head. So it, it's 
kind of neat stuff that, that can make your site look a little bit more dynamic, but it's not the actual content of the site. So in the body, this is everything that actually shows up on the screen. So this is where you would put all of your headers, your paragraph text, any buttons, lists, images, pretty much everything. So, you know, 95% of what you're going to be coding for this project is going to go into the body. One thing that I do want to talk about is Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is, it's an engine. Uh, and, and an engine is basically just someone did a lot of work so that you don't have to do it. So in, in the case of Bootstrap, they've done a lot of work around how to make things like navigation bars, how to really easily format your web page, so that all you have to do is, is use little tiny snippets of, or phrases that, that I'll get into, um, and then Bootstrap does all the work for you. So it's a front-end CSS and JavaScript framework. Um, it's also really good with what are called responsive designs. So when we say that a design is responsive, what we're saying is that if the screen is this wide, it's going to look like you know a desktop, right? But if your screen is this wide, then everything gets condensed in a way that makes it so that all of your words don't just stack on each other, but it actually just looks like a mobile designed website. So that, that's what we are talking about when we say responsive is that if I were to just crunch the window while looking at my website, um, it wouldn't suddenly get messed up, but instead everything would sort of lie on top of each other as it should to make the site look a little bit more mobile friendly. I'm sure you've had examples where you've looked at web pages that looked great on both desktop and mobile, and then other ones that you would just never look at on your phone because it just wouldn't work. Um, or you would never want to look at it at your computer because everything would be super stretched out and it, it wouldn't make as much sense. So that's an example of a site that is not responsive. Um, but Bootstrap helps you be responsive uh, to different screen sizes. Um, in order to get Bootstrap to work, what you'll do is you'll post basically this exact code into your head. And then once you've done that, you pretty much have access to all of the Bootstrap elements that you need. And just to be a little bit more clear, this first line is the CSS for all the Bootstrap stylings. The second line is jQuery, which is actually another, it's a JavaScript engine that um, makes things a little bit easier for JavaScript coding. And Bootstrap is dependent on it in order to work properly. And then this third line is the bootstrap code. Okay, so these all link out to websites that are on the web. If you were to copy this link and then paste it into your browser, you're just going to see a bunch of text. And so what you're doing is you're basically inheriting all of the work that they put in to create that text so that now your site is feature rich with all the bootstrap features. Any questions about bootstrap? And again, we'll, we'll go into how that works uh, later on in the lecture. Okay, so these are some of the Bootstrap features. I, I would really encourage you to check out this W3 Schools tutorial um, because it, it helps show you how some of these features are used. But these are some of the most common features that you see on websites today. So there's the grid format, um, which we'll, we'll get into later, but it's a, a nice way of laying your website out in a standard format. Tables, so I, I know tables were mentioned um, as something that, that you all wanna use. So this is a very nice way of putting tables in your web page. Different image formats. So I, I could imagine for like the, let, let's say the podcast example, you might wanna have these sort of stylized images to display that podcast for the users so that this could be a, a good tool for that. Alerts, so if you wanna be able to, let's say for the drone application, you wanna show success when someone's either called a drone or entered their payment information, you can use bootstrap alerts to just give a, a real quick success um, alert onto the screen. This glyph icons, these are just very common um, web icons that, that are used. So here you can musical notes. I'm sure that would be relevant um, for the podcast example. Uh, you know, zoom icons, which which might be relevant for if you're trying to zoom in and out of a map, that sort of thing. Um, 
labels. So if you want to be able to do some of these pop-ups, let's say, um, that might help with user training or onboarding. If you're not sure if the layout that you have is, is going to be as, um, let's say, effective as you need to be, and you might want to have like a information icon that they can hover over and then a label pops up, gives them more information. You can use that for that. Carousels, this is obviously very popular on uh, most websites that you see where you can basically shift between different images that show how the website works. And then progress bars, also very important uh, for showing people either what their score is, um, maybe how good a match is, or how, how close a web page is to processing their request, that sort of thing. So the first thing that I'm gonna go over with you all is a nav bar. So this is some code. Don't worry about looking into this right now. I'll show you a little bit more of how it's built. Um, but this is gonna be using certain bootstrap principles in order to put a nav, gar, nav bar on the top of web page. Some of the things that, that I, I want you all to explore is how to make a bootstrap fixed nav bar make a bootstrap collapsible nav bar, responsive nav bars, nav bar logos, search bars, that, that sort of thing. So I think for the most part, a lot of your wireframes showed a nav bar as part of what you wanted. And, and so I'll show you how to make that nav bar um, actually right now. Um, but first I wanna show you a little bit more about collaborating and grids. So for grids, this is, um, it's something that's actually much easier for me to show than, than to show you the code, but to show you how it works. Um, but you can see that there's this 12, 6, 4, and MD, SM, XS. So that this XS, SM, MD, this is basically screen size. So XS is the smallest possible screen. MD is more like a laptop screen. And then these numbers are how many units you want to give an element to take up. So for some reason, they picked 12 as the maximum. So if you did XS 12, that means that you want it to take up the whole screen on a small screen. And then MD4 means 12 divided by four is three. So you want it to take up a third of the screen. Um, and I'll show you how that works a little bit later. But then some of the things that I want you all to, to view after I've done this is how to make a fully responsive website, how to deal with like pop-ups, button links, animations, all sorts of things with uh, Bootstrap. And I'm putting this here just so that you can have it uh, to check out later, um, but I'll show you how the grid and, and the layout work um, in the second half of the lecture. Professor, I had a quick question. Yes. So related to the size, uh, if you can go back, mm -hmm. as screens kind of get bigger with more, I don't know, with Apple kind of increasing their size and stuff like that, is that something that developers have to keep on changing every year? It, it is in a way, um, but the, the good thing about screens is that they've mainly stuck to a, a similar aspect ratio. I think where things would get complicated is if for some reason the aspect ratio suddenly changed. Um, I, I know, for instance, that I think it was Samsung uh, came out with a foldable, foldable uh, screen, and which is really cool, but the aspect ratio is very different. And so what they're finding is that that's now a new thing that people have to take into account when they're building responsive web pages. Um, the iPad was the most recent example where suddenly the iPad is just sort of this like weird in-between screen. Um, and so sometimes people's web pages might look a little bit funky in the iPad. They're more likely to look funky on an iPad than on a smartphone or on a, on a regular desktop. Um, so it's, it's usually when the aspect ratios change that there's a problem. Um, but to your point, with a really big screen, if you're not using a high resolution image, then that could look really bad on that big screen. So, so there is a little bit of work that developers have to do to make sure that you know on the big screen, they're using a higher resolution image, but then on a smaller screen, they're using a, a smaller, easier to load image, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so a little bit into GitHub. Uh, 
GitHub is basically a way for multiple users to work on the same code at the same time. Um, and, and this is something that I, I really want to make sure we get right. So please, please um, interrupt me if there's anything that's confusing as we go through this lecture. Um, some of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about are clones, how to make issues, what a branch is, what a pull request is. And then once you sort of do a bunch of coding on your branch, how you turn that into a pull request and then how that request gets merged into the overall code. So Git is essentially version control. So it's a way to make sure that when you make changes to the code, that we have a paper trail of how those changes were made so that if for some reason a change might break the software or break the web page, you can always go back and you sort of know what got you to that broken, broken point. Um, there was sort of the dark ages when version control was not used and people really didn't have any ability to understand when code broke um, or how they could go back to the fixed state. So Git is really, it's a godsend for developers and it's used by pretty much every developer out there. Um, so it's very important to get right. Um, now, when we talk about branching and all of that, everything's relative to the master. So the master, or, or actually it sometimes it's called main as well, is your main level of code. And if you wanna make changes to that main level of code, you could either push those changes directly onto the code or best practice is actually to create a branch and then work on that branch until it's ready to go. And then you merge it back into your main line of code. So this way, when you need to work on a new feature, you can sort of break it, like do whatever you want with it. Um, and then make sure that you get it as right as possible before you merge it back into the code that's actually showing up on the screen to users. Um, and, and I'll show you what that process looks like and how you can build in processes to make sure that when you do this merge, you're not gonna break the code that users see, okay? Now, obviously with you all, there's a little bit more leeway because if the code breaks, there's no users, right? You're, you're not gonna get phone calls uh, right away from angry users saying, hey, what, what did you do? You, you broke the tool. Um, but it's still a good habit to get into uh, to make sure that you're, you're coding in a way that really is gonna enable you to collaborate with different developers um, down the road if, if you ever go that route in your career. Okay, so step one, uh, this is the, the start of the interactive part of this lecture. Um, is I want you all to check if you have Git. So raise your hand if, if you're using a Windows or PC, something like that. Okay, and then raise your hand if you're using a Mac. Okay, so, so we're, we're about 50-50. Um, for Windows, what I'm gonna have you do is open up the start menu and then try to find the command prompt. Okay, so if you open up that start menu and, and there's a search bar, you can search CMD and that should bring up your command prompt and then open that up. On the Mac, what I want you to do is open Spotlight, um, which is command and space, and then type terminal into the open command line. And then this is gonna bring up the Mac version of the command prompt and it's called terminal, okay? And I want you to raise your hand when you've got your command prompt or terminal open. Okay, cool. Looks like we're set. Now I'd like everyone to type git version and then enter. Now, if it works, which I think is gonna be a minority of you, um, but if it works, it's gonna tell you that you have a certain version of git. Um, now raise your hand if it told you that right now. Okay, so, so just maybe a third of you. And then the rest I'm gonna assume you don't have Git yet. So if you don't have Git, these are the instructions to install it. So it's 
get hyphen scm.com slash download and then slash win if you're Windows and then Mac if you're Mac. The, the setup on this, it, it's honestly, it's a little bit um, difficult to do in, in a, a remote situation, um, but I really got a lot of feedback from the class last year that they would like to be fully empowered to use this software instead of sort of before we were doing a sort of a more um, abridged version. So I think that if we get this all right up front, I think it's going to pay dividends down the road. Professor, do you want us to download the 32-bit, the 64-bit? I don't think it matters. Um, I have the 32-bit, so it should be fine. So basically, go to that page, install it, and then get your terminal open, which it should already be open, and then type git version, and then it, it should be on your computer after installation. You might have to restart actually your, your command prompt if it doesn't show up right away. And so, sorry, Professor, should you should you press uh, let git decide or override the default branch for new responsibilities? Um, I, I would say let git decide. Okay. And, and what you're installing is basically a, um, they, they call it a, uh, a command line interface or CLI. And it's a way of talking to the different version control sites out there. So GitHub is the most famous example, Bitbucket is another, um, but I'll show you how you can use, once you have Git, these commands to push what's on your local machine onto the Git repository. And that's really critical because you could, if you wanted to, like if you just hate using Git, you could just do what I showed you last week on GitHub and directly edit the code and, and that'll work just fine. But the magic of having Git on your local computer is that you can make all sorts of changes to the code and really see the changes in real time. All you have to do is click reload on your browser. Um, and, and so it's really cool. Um, and, and really empowering when, once you have your computer set up this way. Uh, so I think it's worth it to, to go through a little bit of this upfront setup in order to give you that power. Okay. Professor, I don't know if anyone else had this problem, but I downloaded the git bash, the 32 gigs, and then I'm trying to type in the command window, but it says git is not recognized as an internal or external uh, command. Gotcha. So you opened the git bash? Uh, I believe so. You might. Let me try one more time. Oh. Yeah, let me go share my screen. I, now I have like two things kind of open. OK. So this is my command prompt. And this one's my git bash. Okay, so so in your case, then you'll use git bash. Okay. Instead of your command prompt. Okay, so okay, so that's the git version. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else having issues? Uh, raise your hand if you're good. Professor, I'm kind of lost because I went on the download page, but there's a couple to download. Is this Windows or Mac? Mac. Um, download. Yeah, I can. So don't do the the um, homebrew. Actually, just do the. Uh, Yeah, sorry. Um, I 
I, I can um I can work with you uh later on, on how to get that on on your computer. Um, okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Okay. So so let me go back to sharing the screen. Okay, so this is something that um, getting familiar with some of these commands on your command line are, is pretty important. Um, and also it's not too bad once you get used to it. So what I'm gonna do is share with you my command line. Okay, so this is an example of my terminal. And now if I type PWD, I can see where I am. So in my case, I'm at users slash William Rosh slash documents slash sample project. So I've, I've created a folder in my documents folder called sample project. And this is where I'm gonna put everything. Um, if I type LS, it shows me what's in there. In this case, nothing. Um, so LS is list the current files in the directory, CD, means change to a new directory. So I can also do cd dot dot slash to go backwards. So if I do that, I'm back into documents. I type ls and I can see what's in there. And I can do cd sample project to get back into sample project. Oops. Actually, because I put a space in there, I have to put these little escapes. Um, so I go back in here and now nothing is in here yet. But now what I'm gonna do is I wanna download the GitHub repository onto my computer. So for this to happen, uh, we need whoever is gonna be the owner of the repository. So this would be whoever the team lead is to go into your repository. So in my case, it's actually, it's not this, it's, this, and then click settings, manage access. And in this case, I have to log in because I wasn't logged in. And then invite collaborators. So this would be the other members of your team, okay? Now, this just enables everyone to sort of have access and permissions, but even before they do that, assuming that you've made your, your repository public, um, all they have to do to get your code is to go to your project page. So in this case, and for me, it's github.com slash wrosh slash wrosh.github.io. Click this code button. And then this is the, the link that they need to use to clone the code onto their computer. And, and when we say clone, we're really talking about just copying all the files onto your local computer, okay? So whoever the leaders are of your team, if you could share the link to your repository with your team members, then they can copy the code and download it to their computer. Um, what should I do since my team isn't here? So in your case, uh, John, you you just have to download it to your computer. And, and then um, we, we can work with your teammates um, later to make sure that they get the code onto theirs. Okay? okay. Sounds good. So if you all wouldn't mind just sharing maybe in the chat uh, the link to your GitHub page then that will enable your teammates to have access to it. Once you're on this page for your particular project, in order to get it to your computer, you can do two methods. If you aren't able to have Git working on your computer yet, just click here and then you can download the zip file. And then when you open that zip file, it's going to open the code up on your computer. Okay. 
if you have git, what you can do is type git clone and then whatever this link is. So I click this, it copies it to my clipboard and I can paste it. So it's git clone and then the link to my repository, or in this case, it would be the repository for your team project. And I type enter and it actually downloaded all of that code onto my computer. This is very quick because it's not a lot of code. I type ls and now I can see that there's a folder called wrosh.github.io. Now I can cd change directory into wrosh.github.io. Now I'm in. I can see that there's an index.html, src folder, basically all the things that I created on a GitHub. Professor, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I think I'm still a little confused. So I got to the link okay. and if I sent, I, the, Alana, I think I sent it to you or see if you can access that. After the after she has the link, she'll go into her, her Git and then type CD and put the link in, is that correct? Yeah, so she gets to this link. Let's say this is your link for your project, uh -huh. right? Then she can click on code and you'll do the same thing. Copy this link and then go back into the, the git bash or the command prompt, whatever that might be. And then she just needs to be somewhere in her directory um, where she knows what it is. So PWD will show her where she is. In this case, I'm users slash William Roche slash documents slash sample project, right? And then as long as she's in somewhere like downloads documents, wherever she wants it to be, then she can type git clone and then your link. And then that's essentially a command to download all of the code into that location that she's currently in, in the command prompt. Sorry, how do you copy paste in this? Oh, never mind, never mind. Uh, I was trying to go access my own, but it says permission denied. Could not create a work tree. I don't know. I don't know if I'm in the right directory though. Okay. Here, let me see. Alana just sent me her code. Has anyone been successful? Raise your hand. Okay, so a couple of people. I think, you know, it, it is important that we um, get this right. Uh, so I think if you all, whoever's having issues, we can just follow along um, with the lecture. Uh, I think it's important to sort of pay attention to some of the coding techniques anyway. Um, so of course you'll have this on recording, but just let me know what are the error messages that you're getting. And then I can work with you all independently to make sure that we get it right. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes these initial rollouts can be a little bit frustrating, but if we do it right from the start, I, I think it's gonna be a lot easier to make sure that uh, the, the coding goes well throughout the next few lectures. Okay, um, so we'll just keep moving forward. All right, so I have now downloaded my code onto my local machine. And so just to show you a little bit of what that looks like, if I go to documents, sample project, it's right here. And now this index.html file, I can open it with Google Chrome. And if I do that, this is actually my web page. So it's a very simple web page, but 
I open it up with my browser and it actually shows up. And, and if I make changes to certain files, those are going to show up as well. And, and so that's, that's really the cool part is that once I get this set up on my computer, I make little tiny changes and then I just, all I have to do is click reload and I can see what those changes look like. Okay. So I've opened that up with my browser. One other thing I want to open that up with is my text editor. So if I haven't downloaded one, I can just use text edit. Um, or if I've downloaded one of these fancy coding editors, I can use that. So in this case, I have Visual Studio Code. I'm gonna open that up right now. And it's in my other screen. So I just have to bring that down. So I'll show you a little bit of how this works. So in this case, I have a web page that says, this is Will Rosh's nav bar. If I want to change this to just, this is Will's web page, and I just make that change, click save, reload, and now it's changed. Okay. So that's essentially how this works. Um, and then I'll make some changes. I'm going to show you how to make a nav bar. And then once we've done that, I'll show you how to, once you've done those changes, push those changes into uh, the GitHub repository and then merge them with what already exists, okay? So I know we've sort of gone through a lot. Let's take a break, uh, maybe a 15 minute break, and then we can come back and I'll show you how to code a nav bar and, and what that looks like and then how to push that back onto GitHub, okay? And I'll stay here uh, if anyone has any questions in the meantime. Okay, so we'll, we'll get started with coding at 3.45 p.m. So worst comes to worst, if you want to edit, all you have to do is click on the file. So in this case, I want to make uh, index.html and then just change here. So I, I can do edit this file. This is Will Rosh's, I'll just say this is Will's page, right? And then I can write what I did. So it changed from nav bar to page, commit change. And now if I reload, oh, actually that's not it. Um, I would go to wrosh at github.io and now it says this is Will's page, okay? So if you can't get it to work on your computer, you can just make the changes directly on GitHub. Um, but as you'll see, there's a lot more flexibility with what you can do if you've got a, a code text editor and you're doing it from your local computer. Um, but I, I'm here to help you as you try to implement these things because um, you know this is really about empowering you to be able to use code uh, properly, okay? So let's go back to code. Now this page, you can see that it's actually not a web page. It's grabbing directly from my hard drive. So, and this is why when I make edits to my code editor, like this is ALS colon four web page and click save, it immediately changes. Okay, so, so again, this is why it's nice to be able to make these changes on your local computer because it enables it to all just pop up right away. Okay, um, now let me just, I created, <clears throat> okay. So the very first thing that, that I um, wanna show you is how to use Bootstrap to make a nice looking navigation bar. And in order to do that, the first thing remember that I showed you in the slides was that information that you had to put into the head. So what I'm gonna do is I just copied it and it's in the slides, but it's these three lines of code. So the first thing was the um, oops, the CSS code. 
for Bootstrap. So you can see it's got that extension CSS. Second line is this jQuery. So this is a library for JavaScript that Bootstrap JavaScript is dependent on. So once I've done these, I basically have all the powers of Bootstrap um, on my code base, even though my code is at this point only 15 lines long. Okay, so I'm gonna start making my nav bar. So in Bootstrap, to make a nav bar, I can give it a nav class or a nav um, element with the class equals nav bar. And then we're gonna do a nav bar um, fixed in the top. And this is because I want my nav bar to always be on the top of my screen, okay? Now, the very first thing that I usually want is uh, I, I want it to be sort of within a container. Now, Bootstrap has a container called div class equals container fluid. And now the container fluid is basically just telling Bootstrap that I want my nav bar to be in a container that's always the full width of the screen. So remember we talked about responsiveness. If I have my element that I'm putting my, my nav bar within in this container fluid, then it's always gonna be the full width. Okay. Now the format, does anyone remember how to make lists from, from Code Academy? So to make a list, you do something called UL, which means unordered list. And that, that basically means it's gonna be like bullet points instead of numbers. And I'm actually gonna give this the class nav and then nav bar nav. And, and this is all um, within the bootstrap documentation. So you can just sort of copy what I'm doing um, in your code, but it, it's basically a way to tell bootstrap that we're now gonna put a nav bar within this list. So now within an unordered list, we use li, which means it's basically the symbol for a bullet point, okay? Now within this li, I want this to be called home. I'm gonna create another one that is about us. And you can see by the way that when I create an element, as soon as I close it, the text editor actually creates a, uh, a closing element for that element. So this is one of the nice things about using the fancy text editors is if you're just using WordPad or you're just editing directly in, in GitHub, um, you don't get any of those tricks. It, it just, you just have to type everything out. Um, and, and you also don't get any of the coloring that helps you understand, you know, what is an element versus what's a class and, and all of that, okay? So we've done home, about us, um, and then let's do another one that's maybe diseases. So now I have a list for my nav bar. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so this doesn't look great, but I can see that it's sort of following the format of a navigation bar, okay? Sorry, Professor, I just had a quick question about um, how do you get it to update? So I believe that I'm interacting on the same thing on the VSC and I'm putting code into it, but it's not updating on the actual website. So what one thing that you have to make sure you're doing is right now I'm editing this index file and the index file is, let me just, I got to it by opening this file, okay? So this is my code. I opened it with Visual Studio Code. I can also open it just by clicking open on here, right? And then finding it. And then to get it to show up on my browser, what I'm doing is I'm right clicking that same file and then doing open with Google Chrome. And then when I do that, it's actually not a website. All this is, is that file. So when I make changes to that file, 
right? If, if I say, um, instead of diseases, maybe it's um, patients, then I click save, and then I reload this page. Now you can see that that changed into patient, right? Because I changed this to patient. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I believe I'm doing the right thing. It's just, it is not updating. And my Visual Studio Code 2, my titles are in blue instead of red. I don't know if that changes anything. Sure. The color scheme shouldn't matter at all. Okay. Um, all that matters is that your the file that you're editing needs to be the same file that you've opened up with Chrome, okay? So uh -huh. this is opened up users slash my name slash documents, then the sample project folder, and then um, the GitHub folder that I cloned, and then index file.html. So this is the same file as, you know, if I go into save as this file, I can see that it's in the same path, right? It's, it's in wrosh.github.io. Yes. Okay. So as long as it's the same file, when I save this file and then I reload this page, it should be connected. So if I change home to you know, start, hit save, reload, home change to start. Yeah, I, I get I guess well I can I can talk to you after about it, but it's still not loading correctly. Okay. Is everyone else having the same issue? Is anyone able to raise your hand if you're able to actually get it to work? Okay, so a few, a few of you. So I, I would say for now, let's concentrate on just learning the code part. And then um, I'll, I'll work with you all individually. I know that this is gonna be the hardest week, I think to get everyone set up on coding. And, and so I, I wanna make sure that I'm here for you to help resolve any individual issues that, that you all might be having with your computer. So. Don't worry too much about whether it's working right now. Um, we can work that out after the lecture, okay? Um, let's just focus on the code itself. All right, so I've created these bullet points, start, about us, patient, um, but it is kind of ugly. So what I, what I also wanna do is um, make my nav bar look a little bit better. So, I'm going to open another file, which I had created this within my main folder, uh, SRC folder. So this just means source. And this is where I'm gonna place my CSS files in my JavaScript. So I'm gonna open my base file. And this is where I've sort of put CSS attributes around my, my different text, um, my code, right? So. I have text title. This is the ALS 414 web page. And notice for text title, I called that red. And then I want the font size to be 30 pixels. Okay. So uh, it shows up now on the page. If I were to change this from red to, let's say, black, and then maybe this from blue to gray. And when I reload, it's now black and gray. Okay. One thing that I do want to do is I want to create a class for my nav bar. So I'm going to give it a, um, a box shadow. So this is a, a really nifty CSS attribute where I can basically tell it that I want it to be surrounded by shadows uh, that make it look cool. And, and so here I, I've just sort of figured it out, but you, you can play with how you want it to look. Let, let's see what happens if it's two pixels um, by four pixels. Then it's gonna be put onto this navbar class because I've given it the class navbar. So in this CSS, I'm telling it to have a box shadow. Now, when I reload, it's got a little bit of a shadow underneath, okay? Now there's other sort of, this is one of these things that you just play around with. But I found that if I give it this combination, 
it looks a little bit nicer, right? So a little bit more like an actual shadow. So the next thing that I want to do is go back into my list. So I, I've got this navbar list. I've got start, about us, patient. Um, and then maybe I want to create a, um, a drop down. Create another list with the class equals drop down. And then within this, I actually want to call it, um, you know, something like uh, providers. And I'm actually giving it an A element. Does anyone remember what A means in, in HTML, if it's an element? So A is for links, okay? So within the Bootstrap framework, If I give it a, a link element and then call it drop down toggle and give it something called data toggle and then call it drop down. Then maybe I want to call this providers. So I've got my patients, and then I want another one that says providers. And then underneath that, I create another list that has the class of drop down menu. And I can create a list of providers. So in this case, maybe I want to do like family. Oncology. And maybe something like rare disease. Okay. So now when I click this, you can see that it actually links up. So, and, and this is all just formats. Like you can feel free to just shamelessly copy um, what I've done, but this is all the format for Bootstrap. So if you were to Google, like how to make a Bootstrap nav bar, you'd be able to see people's code that follows this format. So don't worry too much about like, well, why does it have to say data toggle equals drop down? It's all within the Bootstrap documents documentation, um, but it's completely fair game encoding to just look at what someone has done that you like and then copy them, okay? Um, now, one thing that I do wanna do is, um, I don't really like the way that this text shows up. So if I wanna make it look a little bit nicer, I can add a CSS styling to it. So, the way that I might do that is by, let's say I want to style all of my LI bullet points. So that would style all of my, you know, my start, my about us, my patients, things like that. And I can give it a, you know, let's make, give it a little bit of a bigger font size. Oops. So how about our font size will be, um, I don't know, how about 16 pixels? And then uh, how about the color will be blue? And then I actually, because they're so close together, I wanna give them a margin so that they're, they're a little bit distanced from each other. In this case, I'm gonna give it a margin of six pixels. So that'll give it six pixel space, top, bottom, left, and right. So now that I've saved this, when I reload, it looks a little bit nicer, okay? Now, there's other work that I could do um, maybe to make it more aligned with, with what providers looks like. Uh, but for now, I think we can just stick with this. Maybe we're, we're gonna give it a uh, margin top of uh, about 18 pixels. All right, so that gives it a little bit more um, space. If I wanted to make it less, go to like 12, and then just reload. So I can do a lot of trial and error to make sure that it looks okay. Now, one other thing that I might wanna add is a, uh, a brand on the, the upper left. 
So the way that I would do that is actually create a span and give it the class. And this, again, is, is part of Bootstrap, navbar brand. And then we're going to put an image here. So my image will have a source. And now we just need to figure out what that source is. If I reload, I didn't give it a source, so nothing showed up. OK? Now, what I actually want to do is create a folder in here. So I'm going to create a folder, put it in here, and I'm going to call it images. OK? And now I'm going to put an image within this that I want to use as my brand. OK? So how about we just use KGI? Just going to go to Google Images, find a nice KGI logo. This one looks good. Now I'm going to save this image into sample project images. For some reason, I can't download that. That's weird. We'll do this one instead then. KGI logo.jpg. Okay, so delete that one. So now we have this KGI logo.jpg. I can go back into my code and now I know my source. My source is images slash KGI logo that JPG, right? And then that will tell it to look in here. Okay, so now it's in. Um, <laughs> it obviously looks not good at all. Um, so we're gonna actually have to give this a class and, and call it, um, Maybe a nav bar logo. Okay. So now, nav bar logo, we're going to now give it some attributes. So it's obviously way too big. So let, let's say it's going to have a height now of just, uh, let's say, 50 pixels, and then width. Make it auto. And, and the reason I'm, I'm actually putting auto here for width is that I want, as I crunch the height down, for it to not to just look stretched, but instead for the width to get a little bit smaller as it gets smaller. So it's sort of like locking that aspect ratio in um, for the image. So let's see what happens after I do that. Okay. So now it's much smaller and it fits within the navigation bar. Any questions? I know this is a lot. Um, and I know that we sort of had a little bit of issues trying to get this set up on our computers, but it's just to sort of get you started with what coding can look like and, and how it sort of, you, you can really just copy a format and it works just fine, right? So you don't have to worry too much about what all of this looks like, but you can just see, okay, the way that bootstrap nav bars work is that you have to give it this nav bar tag and then um, everything's you know each of these bullets will be a new item within the navigation bar so if i wanted to you know make another one that says like um medications i reload and now suddenly that medications has shown up in my navigation bar okay um now Another thing that I can do. Sir, I do have one quick question. Yes. Um, for your base.css file, what kind of file did you create in the C or your source folder? So it's just a text file. Um, text and now file. what you can do is, honestly, once I've got one of these pages open in my editor, I can just save it as. 
And then I, I could go, you know, save it into my source folder and then call this, um, you know, like index.css. And as long as I give it the right um, suffix, it's going to think that it's a CSS folder. Now, you can see that my colors got all weird. And that's because it doesn't recognize this as CSS uh, code. So I'm just going to go in and delete. And now I just have a fresh file to work off of. So if I want to, you know, name something like navbar again, and I can do that and give it the right attributes. Okay, got it. Thank that you. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now I don't really want this folder, so I'm just not going to bother saving it. Um, now I need to reopen my index file, uh, my index.html, so I can continue editing. Okay. Now another thing. So since I just did that. <clears throat> I could actually turn some of these into links. So as an example, I might want to um, create a link to about us. So I'm going to give it an A file. And now with my link files, if I give it an href, that href is telling it actually what to link to. And I'm going to wrap my about us within this so that anytime I click about us, it's going to go to that href. So if I were to put something like HTTP google.com, when I reload and I click about us, it goes to Google. All right, so that's how I would link out to another page if I wanted to. I want to change that to uh, kgi.edu and I reload. Now it went to KGI. I can even even within um, <clears throat> within an A element, I can create something um, called target, right? And so what target will do, is um, it'll create, sorry, I got stuck there for a second. Um, so if I do target equals underscore blank, don't ask me why it's underscore, but if I do that, then it's gonna pop out. So you can see there, it actually kept my ALS 414 project page and just opened up KGI in a new tab. So if I wanted to do that, I would just add this target equals blank. Okay. And now what I actually wanted to do though is save to a new page. So what I'm going to do is actually create a new file. And I'm going to save this file as about us.html. Now I have an about us HTML file. And I'm actually going to copy all of my code from index into about us.html. But I'm just going to change a few things. So I'll change my title to about us. And then I'll keep my nav bar here. But instead of saying this is the web page, I'm going to say something like about us. All right. And then in my body, I can put like, we are um, you know, new coders building our first prototype. Prototype, okay. Now, when I click about us, oops, I forgot to change the link. So I've created my about us page. Now I need to link to it. So instead of going to kgi.edu, I'm actually going to go to about us.html. And now because if I look in my folders, because index and about us are in the same folder, all I have to do is just name the, the file. And it's gonna be able to, it's gonna look in the same folder, look for that file and then open it up, okay? So let's try that out. 
All right, so now I've gone to a new page. I now have a link. I go back. This is the home page, and now I've linked to the About Us page. Now maybe on the About Us page, I actually want instead of that first tab to say Start, maybe I want it to say Home. Okay, and um, I'm actually just get rid of that. A href. So now we're going to link back to index.html. Now, this is sort of where the, the text editor is trying to be helpful, but it's actually not. So I'm just copying that ending A that it automatically created for me and then putting that back at the other side of home. Okay. So now I click home and it goes back to here. About us goes to about us. Home goes back to the home page. Okay, does that make sense? How I can get different pages now to link to each other using the nav bar. So super simple. The, the only thing that's a little bit annoying is um, there's there are ways to make it so that maybe the nav bar is just only one piece of code and, and I can implement it on multiple pages. I haven't shown you that yet. So for now, we just have to copy and paste it, okay? So here I've got like the about us. If I want my home to look nice, I just have to copy it over, All right? Onto the index. So th this is actually, it's kind of a, a no-no with coding is, is they always say, don't, um, don't repeat yourself. But for now, I, th I think for this example, it'll work, right? Where we'll just have to keep pasting any changes that we make into the navigation bar into the page. But I'll, I'll show you um, maybe some ideas of how to avoid that down the road. Okay, so in this case, I've got my home, my about us. So this part works, right? Let's just do it one more time. Um, Let's do it for medications. So I'm actually just gonna create another one. I'm gonna copy and paste this and then delete medications and then change this to medications. Now I haven't created it yet. I'm going to create a medications.html. So I'm actually going to save this as medications.html. And then I'm just going to change a couple of these things. So oops. medications list. Maybe we'll make a list of meds here. And then instead of this being a P, let's make another list. So we'll call this a unordered list. And we'll just do a bunch of bullet points. So Prozac, right? Then I'm going to copy and then paste it a bunch of times. Lipitor, Remicade. Um, I'll just leave it for now. OK. So let's go back home. Now I've got my medications in here. And here, I actually have a medications list. And if I wanted to, I could maybe make Prozac, let's say uh, a href into whatever the web page is for Prozac. Or let's say I want to link to WebMD. And I'll just copy that link and then make that my link that I'm hreffing into. put Prozac within that. Now, when I click this, it takes me to the WebMD Prozac page, All right? Any questions about how links work in that sense? Okay, so 
another thing we could do is let's go back home. Let's do something with patience. <clears throat> so now I'm going to do a href patience.html. Move that closing one to the other side of patience because I remember I want to wrap my text within the A element if I want it to be a link. Okay. And actually, because I have this text editor, when I hover over A, it gives me a little bit of information about it. Okay. So now I've got patience. Okay. It's linking to patients.html. Oh, actually, this is medications. Huh? Let me go back to index. So I'm going to copy what I did here and then replace my patients line with this. So now I have pretty much a fully linkable nav bar. I have home, goes here, about us, goes to the about us page, medications, goes to the medications list. Patients, that actually doesn't link to anything because remember, I haven't created my patients file. And then providers, that links to our dropdown. Okay, so now actually my nav bar is starting to look good. All right, so next thing up, I'm going to just save this as again. And I'm going to call this patients.html. Now, when I click this, it actually goes somewhere. But because I copied and pasted, it actually looks the exact same as the index.html that's at my home. So, in order to change that, I need to actually change the code within my patients.html file. So, in this case, I'm going to be, you know, how about like check or, you know, maybe meet our patient ambassadors. So, maybe these are patients that are working with our site as coaches or, or something, or, or how about meet our, our patient ambassador coaches, right? Okay, now I can actually do some interesting things. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna find some images, uh, but let, let's actually do blank profile picture. So I'm just gonna steal one of these blank profile pictures. This one looks as good as any. So I'm going to save this image. And remember, I'm within my wrosh.github.io. I created this images folder. So if I save this, this is way too long of a file name. But if I just save it as um, maybe blank profile, oops, dot jpg. Now I should be able to create an image of that. So let's delete this and create an image element with SRC equals slash, or actually just images slash blank profile that JPG. So that's the, the file that I just created. <clears throat> So this is my index page. Now I want to go to patients and look at that. So this file is huge, right? Definitely bigger than I want it to be. So let's make it a little bit smaller. Let's give it a class equals profile image. So this is where I can style it within my CSS. So I actually didn't name it right, profile image. And now that I'm in here, I can give it a height of maybe um, 100 pixels. And then let's say I want them all to be square. So instead of uh, the width, instead of it being auto, 
I'm going to also make that 100 pixels. So now I know that my profile image will always be square. So it knows to make it this because if I go into patients, it's giving it the class profile image. And so I've defined the attributes of that class profile image within this CSS file. And it knows to look there. Sometimes you might find when you're working at this that hey, I keep updating my CSS, but my image is actually not changing. Usually that's because you don't tell it within this HTML file where the CSS is. So if you're finding that it's not changing, it's either because you just didn't name it the same thing, like maybe you named it profile instead of profile image. Um, it, it definitely needs to match what you list as your class here, but also it might be that you're not linking your base CSS. So make sure you're doing that. So everything should be okay. So when I reload that, oh, look at that. Now I have a um, 100 pixel by 100 pixel uh, profile image. I actually think that's too small. So why don't I change that to 200 by 200? Much better. Okay, now what I wanna show you next is bootstrap, um, grid layout. So I'm going to create a div element and I'm actually going to put that image within the div element. Now that div, I'm going to give a class that I actually don't have to define in my base CSS because it's already defined within Bootstrap. And that is this call XS12. And that basically means that I want it to be the full page length if it's a small screen. So I'm going to do a call, maybe MD, and then uh, let's give it a three. And that means that I'm actually going to be able to fit four items within there because 12, for whatever reason, that's their magic number. And 12 divided by three means four. So basically, if it's a big screen, I want my image to take up um, only three of those 12 units. And because I've now got it within this grid, I'm actually going to change this up. I'm going to give the height auto. I actually want the width to be 100% because I want it to be as big as the grid. I want it to shrink on smaller screens. So let's see what happens. Okay, so now you can't quite tell what's going on, but you can see that even though I gave it 100% width, that it's not actually 100% of my screen. It might become more clear if I copy this and put more in. All right, so now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can see now it's more of a grid. Okay, so because I did three here, it can fit again because it's 12 units total, three, 12 divided by three is four. So it's fitting four of these profiles within a page. If I were to, and this is actually a nifty thing with these editors, I can actually highlight something that's repeated and hit Command D and then change them all at once. So if I wanna change this to a four, it's gonna make them a little bit thicker. And 12 divided by four means that there's only gonna be three of these profiles per line, right? So it gets a little bit bigger. Another thing I can do is maybe say, if it's small, I actually want it to be four, but then if it's large, I actually want it to be smaller. So here what I'm telling it, this is responsive design. I'm telling it with a large screen, I want it to only take up three out of the 12 units or a quarter of the space. With a smaller screen, I actually want it to take up four out of 12 or a third of the space. And then with a very small screen, I want it to just take up all 12 units. So just one item per line. So now what I can see when I make this smaller, oh, there, it responded to the smaller screen. And then when I make it really small, it's just one profile 
per line. Does that make sense? So the, the grid layout can be kind of confusing and it's definitely, I mean, I've tried just explaining it um, through the concepts, but I think it's better shown than, than just explained um, because it, it can be a tricky thing, but once you get the hang of it, it's really powerful, um, especially when you want to show a bunch of um, items that, that maybe are slightly independent items. Now, one thing that I can do is I've got these um, divs, right? And I've given them the, the class of this like sort of bootstrap layout, but I could also give it another class that enables me to space it, right? So I might call this like, doesn't matter what I call it, but let's say I'm gonna call it wrapper. And I use that sort of control D thing to call all of them wrapper. And if I create a class called wrapper, I can allow them to just breathe a little bit. So maybe I want to give it a margin and that's the best way to make it breathe. Sort of tells us how much space am I going to put around each element? And we give it 12 pixels of margin. Now when I reload, they're spaced out. So they're not as crammed together as you saw them before. Okay. One last thing I could do, and again, I'm going to use that multi-select thing, is I could put some text underneath each one, right? So I could do like Jane Doe, and then call this John Doe, Doe, uh, Joe Doe, Kate Doe, Jill Doe. So now I've named them. So I, I could, you know, if we wanted to, maybe I would do this for the About Us page too. And it's a good chance to sort of brag about your team. You could even put information under here saying like, oh, you know, I've always dreamt of making this, um, you know, way to deliver medications through drones, you know, something like that. So you can help tell your story um, through the actual web page. Um, now, since they're all dough, I can highlight them all again. Um, and, and maybe I want to give them a class. So let's, because it's text, we'll give it a P element. And then the class is going to equal, um, how about profile text? Right. Oops. Okay, so now I've surrounded them all with this profile text thing. It's not going to do anything because I haven't, given profile text anything, but you can see that it still looks the same. Now, if I create a profile text attribute, I can give it a font size. Oops. Maybe that'll be 16 pixels, color, green. And let's see what that looks like. All right, so now they've got green text, a little bit bigger. How about we make it even bigger? 26. All right. I can even, uh, within wrapper, I think this is going to work. It might not, but it, sometimes. I do text align, I can text align to the center. And now what happens when I give an element this text align center, it means that all of the contents are horizontally aligned if the contents do not completely fill the block or the box, right? So in this case, I could choose like text align left, right, center, whatever that might be. And because I've chosen center, anything that's within wrapper, so that's gonna include my image, and my text should be centered. There we go. So my, now my text has been centered. Okay. How do you do it to the wrapper instead of the, the text itself? So what, what I would do is because I've created this wrapper and there's actually, there's a word for this. The wrapper is the parent for the text. So if I give the attribute to the parent element, 
and in this case, it's wrapper. I've given wrapper text align center, then it just so happens that this text align, it applies to the children. So all children within wrapper, that's gonna include the image, that's gonna include the text, are gonna be centered if I make my text align center. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, what else can we do? We, we can, um, within, let's go back to index. I could choose to, so I've got my nav bar. I could give it a color. I could give it a background color. Um, let's see, how about this beige? Let's see what happens when we give it a background color of beige. All right, you can see that it's beige now, right? It doesn't look that great with KGI having a background of white, but you can see how that prov provides a nice, um, uh, a nice contrast between what the nav bar is and what's below it. Okay, so now I have my home, and my about us, medications list, patients, and my patients are responsive. Okay, let's do, um, how about a table? Because I know that that's something that you all have asked about. Um, why don't we create a new one for providers? So we'll create a table of providers. Let's go back to our index. Now what we need to do is link some of these providers. So let's just do this one. So we're gonna give it a, a element, href equals family.html. Okay, so now I click here, family links to family.html. Now, of course it doesn't work because I never created a family.html. So, I'm going to save this as family.html. And now I have the start of my family page. So family practice. Choose the doctor for your family, you know, something like that. All right, family practice doctors, choose the doctor for your family, right? So I've created my file, it all works. Now I just need to create a table. So HTML actually has this table element. And then within the table element, um, I, I can have all, all, all sorts of different things. So let's just see the best way to do this. Um, <clears throat> R is a row, and then um, we, we actually have TD as well. And I'll, I'll just show you HTML tables. W3 schools is a great way to look at that. So they show you how to make a table. So as I showed you, each table is defined with a tr tag. Each header might be defined with a th tag. And then um, each cell is like a td. So the way that they have this set up is you have your table as your furthermost parent element. And then each row is spelled out. And then within each row, you have each column. OK? So going back to our project, we can do, and actually, I did one of the second rows first, let's start with the TH. Oops. The TH, TH. And now I want to give it 
um, certain columns. So you can say name as the first one. Phone. And then maybe a location, right? And now for our, our first entry, actually, it's nice to have it just on one line. Um, let's call this, you know, Dr. Smith. And then the next column is going to be his phone number or her phone number, 555-222-6666. And then location might be Los Angeles. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so we're getting there. It's not that pretty, but uh, it, it's getting there, right? Um, so some things that we could do is we could actually um, <clears throat> give the table some styles. So border is a good example um, of a style. So I can do like black, um, maybe solid, and then I want it to be one pixel. And that did not work. Uh, let's see. I need to refresh myself on how they styled this. Okay, so to add a border, Oh, one pixel solid black. So I, I did it in the wrong order. I did it in the opposite order. One pixel solid black. Still didn't work. So it might be because I need to include the TH and the TD. Let's try. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Actually, this is my fault. So this is a, a common mistake is sometimes you, you can get caught up in the difference. And it's nice to sort of group them just so that you don't get confused like I just did. Is if there's a dot in front of it, that means I'm styling a class. A table is not a class. A table is an element, right? The classes are the things I name. So I decided to name that the one element with the profiles wrapper. Right, um, I gave that that specific name um, right here. Same with profile text and profile image. So anything where I've done that with a class, I need to put this dot in front of it. That's just the nomenclature. If I'm styling an entire element, like I wanna style all of my bullets or I wanna style um, all of my tables, then I don't put the dot in front. Um, so this is sort of a more general way of styling. Um, when you don't put the dot in front. So now that I've done it, it's shown up. But because I didn't include the TDs and the TIs as they did, it's just the outer part of the table. So if I wanted to, I could actually make the table thick, maybe four pixel border, and then the TDs and the uh, THs, get that a one pixel solid black, right? So now it's thick on the outside, but then sort of the, the divisions between the different cells um, are, are much less thick. One other thing I could do is I could style my THs to maybe have a background color of yellow. I've now styled the top of my header. Maybe I don't like that um, they're so crunched up, right? So I can use padding to give myself six pixels of space around everything. That didn't work. Maybe it's actually the margin that I need to do. That did not work either. Um, so a lot of this is trial and error, uh, but you can see. 
cell padding. Hey, that should have worked. So use the CSS padding. <clears throat> So one thing that is actually a little bit dangerous, and this might be where I'm screwing up, is that I've decided uh, to just give my elements these attributes. In some ways, it's actually a lot neater if you just name them all. So in this case, I'm just going to name all of these uh, given the class. Um, let's see patient, or not patient, um, this is actually doctors, right? So provider, better. And then I'll just put that in here and here. This way, I have something that's super specific to my one page. When you get in the business of trying to design all of your tables, all of your TDs, all of your THs, all of your LIs, right? All of your elements, you might find that as your site becomes more complicated, you don't want every table to look like this. And, and so that's where having this sort of format where, where you're just styling it yourself can be advantageous. Okay, so now it's still yellow, which means that, that I've sort of done that right, okay? Um, now, I do want to now give everyone another class, which might be um, provider cells. So if I put a space between classes, it treats it as a different class. That's why an individual class name can't have spaces because the space is sort of how it decides Okay, so you, you want this to have the class name provider header, and then you also want it to have another class called provider cells. So that's where that space is important. Okay, so let's style these now. And they're not headers, so I just want to put this provider cells in. And copy it. Okay, so now I have all of my cells have this class provider cells but then only the top row has this class provider header. So now provider cells, okay, I named it properly. I want them to have this border with this amount of padding. There we go, cool, so it worked. So all I had to do is sort of name my class. And I really would encourage you, even though I did it sort of for expediency, I tried to name the elements, I would encourage you to just create a class for every little thing that you want to style. Obviously, it would have made my life easier, but some, sometimes you get lazy when you're coding and then it, it almost always comes back to bite you. So let's just create another one, um, Professor Gonzalez, or Dr. Gonzalez, um, three, seven, um, and, and then maybe Dr. Gonzalez is in. Malibu. I can create another one. Um, may, maybe um, Dr. Chu. And then maybe Dr. Chu is in um, Santa. Actually, let's put him in Claremont. Okay. All right, so now I've got a table with a bunch of rows. Cool, so you all can feel free to shamelessly copy the code and, and just put your own style into it, right? Because it should be a look that fits the branding of, of the product that you're trying to put in, okay? And once you've got a table, there's all kinds of things that you can do with it. I, I'd encourage you to just look through, this W3Schools is a great site. I'd encourage you to write it down um, you can look for all sorts of things around how to style tables. Um, it, it also is the same for Bootstrap. So I know there's a lot of jargon with the creation of the nav bar that might've been like, oh, why do we call it that? 
you can you can see a lot of the reasons behind why they do that at W3 schools. So I would definitely encourage that um, as, a, as a useful tool as you move forward with your projects. Okay, so now what have I built? I've got a nav bar. That nav bar has a home page. It's got an about us page, medications list. Some of them link out to other pages like W or WebMD. Patients, I've got my patients ambassadors in this responsive sort of list. And then I've got my family practice doctors listed in a table. And maybe I actually would like to check them out in a map, right? So the thing that I would encourage you to do here is maybe just use your Google map. And then as an example, you see that I've like marked off places, right? Now, these places that I've marked off, these are actually just restaurants, but you could mark them off as if they were doctors, right? And you could give them whatever color, whatever look you wanna give them. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is take a screen grab of this page. Now that's gone to my desktop. So let's open up another screen, go to desktop, oops, find that screen grab. We're gonna rename that. Let's call it um, maybe provider map, okay? I'm gonna drag that, put that into my images folder. So now I've got my provided map within images. It's actually a PNG image. Right. And now let's go back to family. So underneath the table, why don't we put that image? Okay, so image, oh, not class, sorry, SRC. I want to go look in images slash provider. Oh, spell it wrong. Images slash provider map. Out. Boom, now I got a map, right? This is obviously a very ugly map. So why don't we style it? Equals provider map. Oops. Okay. Provider map. How about um, width equals 100%. Let's just make it as big as the page. Height equals auto, because we don't want it to get scrunched. All right, now it's a little bit more palatable. Maybe make it a little bit smaller. 25% of the width of the page. And then let's give it a little bit of a margin, 12 pixels, so that it's not all up against the table. There. A little bit better. I could even go back to family, copy this family practice doctors, because maybe I want that to be down here as well. So beneath table, family practice doctors. Instead, let's say map of providers. There we go. Cool. So now I got my providers with the table. And then underneath, I've got a map of where they are. This is good enough. I mean, honestly, if, if you all like figure out the Google API and I, if you want to do that, I'm there to help you. Like, I would love to show you how to do that. Um, then that's, that's superb. Um, but if you just want to visualize the map through an image, that's perfectly okay. Okay. All right. So I'll stop coding for now because I know that's a lot to take in. Um, I can share my repository with you so that you've got that um, and, and you've sort of got code you can play around with and copy. Um, but actually, let me show you one thing. So I've got all this code that I changed. If I type git status, all these red things are codes that I've changed. So index already existed, base already existed. And so they've now been listed as modified.
But then all of these ones, they've been added. I added them with you guys right now. So it's not in my GitHub at all. In fact, if I go on here and look, you can see all I've got is index. And it's this super simple index, not nearly the, the complex one that I've just created. So I actually want to update GitHub. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is it's called Git Checkout. So I'll show you. Actually, I did this earlier so that I'd have the, um, the code. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. So Git Checkout. If I do git checkout hyphen B, I can check out a branch. So remember, we talked about when you want to work on code, you want to check out a branch first. So I'm going to actually call this branch, um, you know, let's, let's, let's call it a Will's feature. And then I'm going to do that. So this is actually something that would be better to just do up front um, instead of now that I've already done it. But since I've already done it, I actually don't need to do that. I'm just going to show you what happens when you, you push code forward. So on Visual Studio Code, there's this little Git thing where this is super easy. If I want to look at what's changed, these are new files. So basically everything's changed. Index means that they just, you know, I changed these. I'll make this a little bit bigger. I added some of this information but I can review what I've changed and then click this plus button. And then that will add or stage my code. If I don't have Visual Studio Code, that's fine. I'll just type git add and then copy the file. So git add index, git add source slash base. Status. Now I can see that because they've been added, they're green. Git add about us, it add family, it add images, I'm just going to add all these files. Now remember that index.css, it actually doesn't do anything. Um, in fact, if I open that up, blank. So I'm not going to add that. I'm just going to leave that. Now that I've got the files that I've changed green, I'm going to commit them. So git commit is basically a way of committing that I'm going to make this change with these files that I just changed or that I just staged. So I'm going to name them. I'm going to say added um, navbar with images and medication, patients, providers, and family page. So you just want to summarize the change that you made. Now it's done that. And then I can do git push. And updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. It's usually caused because another repository pushed to the same ref. Okay, so the reason this happened is because I did not update GitHub. Um, or I didn't update, sorry, my local code before um, updating GitHub. So that's actually a mistake that I made. Um, now, in order to make sure that you are up to date, and a very important thing is to type git pull. And when you type git pull, what you're doing is you're making the code look the way that the repository looks. So that makes sure that you don't run into the issue that I just ran into, which was that changes had been made to the repository that had not been made to my local machine. So it's very important that you do that um, so that you don't run into the issue that I just ran into. Um, I might be able to, though, let's see what happens if I try to add a branch. So let's just do git checkout minus B. Um, this is how I create a branch, and, and we'll just call this Will's changes. So 
So now I'm on a new branch. Let's just make sure that everything looks okay. Okay, so everything's still good. Status. Um, oh, I can push my branch back by just using this language that they told me. Okay, and now it's been implemented onto GitHub. And now when a branch is merged onto GitHub, you end up seeing this thing that says, Will's changes had recent pushes less than a minute ago. And so that enables you to look at what's changed and then um, how something can be merged, right? So, so here I can see all of the changes that I made and then merge them into, um, into my page. Now, I think the reason why um, it gave me the error first is because Back when I was showing you how to edit code, I um, this was like at the beginning of the lecture, I went into index and I changed this a few times. So I changed this to like, this is Will's page, this is whatever. Um, and, and so what it did is it made sure that I knew that when I was pushing that code, someone else had made changes and I don't wanna necessarily overwrite those changes. So it was actually kind of good that that happened. So it's created this and it says, can't automatically merge. And the reason is because the changes that I made did not take into account other changes that happened on GitHub, okay? So then this is something that we can resolve later on. And I'll show you how to do that in the next lecture. We're, we're running out of time. Um, but you can see that my changes have now been pushed in and they're awaiting approval to merge them into um, the, the actual page, okay? So it says they can't automatically merge it. Um, and that's just because of the fact that I had gone in and changed the code um, on GitHub in between. And so it's sort of just, it's a protection against your own um, sort of mistakes, where it's to protect, in, in my case, me from um, overwriting a change that had been made earlier, okay? So I'll show you how to resolve that in code collaboration next lecture. So let's wrap up the presentation. So cloning, we went through that. Um, local development, I showed you a little bit about how that can work. Status, this was where if you type get status, you're able to see what's been modified or maybe what new files have been created. If you then add those files, you can stage them. And it's just git add and then just copy and paste whatever's in red after modified. Okay, so in this case, index.html, I typed git add index.html. Then when I clicked get status again, it showed me that this has now been staged. Once I've staged all the files that I wanna push on the GitHub, then I type git commit minus M and then whatever the changes I made. So in this case, I said, you know, I created a um, family page, a provider page and about us page. I added an nav bar and all that. So you're basically letting everyone know what you've done. And then that shows up on GitHub. So when I made that change, everyone can now see, okay, well, what did he do? He added nav bar with images and medication, patients, providers, and fam, ran out of space. So it went on into the description. So you can sort of see what someone is doing before you merge it into the platform. And then you get push so that you can push those changes live into GitHub. Branching, this is what I showed you. This is sort of, this is what I should have done at the very beginning is I should have typed git pull in order to make sure that my local machine is even with what's going on in GitHub. And then I should have typed git checkout minus B and then the name of the branch that I wanna create. So that, that might be the will branch or if I wanna name it after the feature, 
I would say the nav bar branch, something like that. Um, and then once I'm done making the changes, I can then push it back to GitHub. And then it creates those pull request alerts that I showed you. And then that's something that during your meeting, you can say, okay, here are the changes that were made. Do we like them? Do we want to merge them all? Um, are there any overlaps? Things like that. So that's how it makes sure that if um, you know I make a change and then Tristan makes a, a change to the same code at the same time, that we don't have any conflicts. So this stage allows you to resolve any conflicts. So merging, this is where you resolve those conflicts. Project leader can merge any pull requests that are made. Um, and then they're just making sure that these pull requests that happen, and again, that's what happens after you um, type git push, that they don't conflict with each other. So make sure that no one's modifying the same code within files. Um, and I really would recommend that you sort of keep your files separate. So, you know, maybe I'll work on index and then Alana will work on the patients page. So that way we know we're not gonna step over each other's toes. Again, anytime a major merge occurs, you should update your local code just by typing git pull. And all that's gonna do is download all of the current code back onto your computer so that you're aligned with everyone. Issues, this is another page on GitHub that allows you to keep track of tasks, bugs, et cetera, that you might need. When you write an issue, you can use the at symbol uh, in order to call someone out. So I could go onto GitHub, issues, type a new issue and say, new um, pull request made that conflicts with um, existing code. And I might say at myself, um, we need to get to together to figure out where the conflict is and how to resolve it. And so this can be a communication tool for my team, right? So for group work, uh, I just want you to start working on your homepage on GitHub. Think about what do you want to say? That's the HTML. What, color do, what colors and images do you want to use? And then um, what sort of inputs and outputs might you want to use for JavaScript? Troubleshooting, this is a big one. Um, I, I would say that 80% of uh, new concepts that web developers learn, they learn by Googling it. So um, if you have a specific image or issue, such as how to create a form with labels on HTML, um, just type it exactly as it is in, in your head. So um, maybe for my, uh, my, my problem with the, the tables, right? I could say like, why is my HTML table, you know, not um, or, or, or not having margins between cells, something like that. And then I can see, okay, space between TD, how do I move? This is actually unwanted space but I can get a good idea for what's going on. So this person, they're designing an HTML email template that forces them to use tables. In the code below, they're having trouble removing the space. So they actually wanna remove space between different lines. And then someone figured out what was wrong. So you can even, most people have had the same problem that you've had, whatever it might be, and you just have to sort of find that match. Um, but if, if worst comes to worst, you can always ask a question on Stack Overflow and people respond, honestly, within usually half an hour. People are very quick. Th this website is awesome. I mean, I've used this very uh, frequently in order to resolve my problems with code. So I would I recommend you do the same, okay? Um, and then of course, email me. Uh, I'm here to help. So make sure you use me as a resource as often as you can, okay? Um, last thing I want to go over is user testing. 
So I do want to get started on, on getting your prototypes in front of users. And I, I think the best way to do that is just to start um, doing that now. Uh, you don't have to have code. You, you could just use a, your wireframe um, if you want uh, for at least the first round of user testing. Um, I would like to talk about though what you all put for your user testing method um, and sort of why you chose the method that you did. So we can close out the lecture with a little bit of that. Um, would anyone like to share what they put? I know that a lot of people put um, concurrent testing. Who wants to speak a little bit to why they chose that? I, uh, oh, you go, you go, Maria. I chose the concurrent testing um, because I think that as the user is talking a lot of the steps that they're doing, like if it doesn't match what the user, or like the developer has in their mind and they can see like those missing gaps. Um, and I think that that's important. And then I think that you can get more information from the user that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then Justin, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just gonna say like the thinking out loud feature I think is really cool with concurrent testing, just like how you can actually hear what they're going through as they're actually navigating. And you can kind of be able to ask them, oh, why, why did you do this? Why did you do this? And if you do it enough times with enough people, you could try to be able to negate some of the like confirmation bias that you might have. Yeah. And now it, it does take a little bit of a skill though, right? Because it's not natural for the users to think out loud. So um, even though you wanna stay out of it as much as possible, you, you will, if you use that method, want to figure out the least invasive way to make sure that they keep talking. So, so what are some of those questions? Anyone want to volunteer? What might be a question you ask if someone's being too quiet? Or a technique that you might use to look into their head a little bit more? Like, take me through what's going on in your mind. Take me through what you're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you might even take note of surprise that they exhibit or, uh, or, or maybe they've gotten into a place that you didn't expect them to get into in the page and just say, you know, hey, what's going through your mind right now? You know, what are you thinking? Talk to me, that, that sort of thing. So you, you can just be very non-invasive in, in the way that you get them to talk. Um, Let's talk about some of the other methods, though. Uh, I think, Danny, you, you had a slightly different take. You, you talked a little bit to the retrospective testing as well. Um, yeah, I chose retrospective probing just mm -hmm. because um, with I, I kind of paired it with concurrent think aloud. And I didn't necessarily like, I guess I wouldn't want the participant to always have to think out aloud because they might kind of like distract them from what um, you might want them to accomplish throughout the testing. Mm -hmm. And so then with like some limited feedback, you'll be able to kind of follow up afterwards with the retrospective probing, like all the kind of questions you want. And then they might be able to provide like a better insight afterwards rather than just doing it throughout the entire testing itself. Yeah. And, and I think, I think one of the, the big areas in which you want to think about doing the retrospective is, is if you've already got a list of things that you want to find out, right? And, and that way you can you can make sure that you've got your list of questions that you're going to ask and, and you can get them all done. And now, by the way, you can always do debriefing after the concurrent think aloud as well. And, and so that can enable you to have a little bit of the best of both worlds. Um, so that, that's definitely something I would encourage you to do is, is sometimes mix a little bit of both techniques in the user testing that you do. Um, in terms of, you know, for user testing, I, I would like to see you get this in front of at least two to three other students um, in, in the coming week. Like I said, you're not going to have much in the way of a prototype, but just have them take a look at your wireframe. And in this case, that think aloud might be a little bit less applicable. You might need to probe them a little bit, um, but just try to get some information to them about what features resonate the most. And then you can use that to guide which ones you focus on in, in the coming weeks. 
Okay. Any questions about that? I have a question for hours. So we, on the wireframe, we actually created an application like for a phone and it wasn't necessarily like on a web page. So how would you recommend to transition what we have on the application onto like a web page design? I would actually encourage you to design it as a mobile app. Um, now it wouldn't actually be an app that you download on the app store, but what I would encourage you to do is essentially um, <clears throat> when you're making these modifications in your code, there's something you can do. Um, and it's different for Chrome, it's different for Apple. Um, with Chrome, you click this inspect, and then don't worry about this code on, on the right, but just check out this. So I can click this and then make it look like a phone, right? Um, so I can toggle it to be the right size. I can even change the type of phone. Maybe I want it to be a larger phone, like an iPhone X. Then I can see what that would look like. Right, or maybe I want to do an iPad, or um, you know, Pixel, that sort of thing. So I would just encourage you, if you want it to be a phone app, um, use a phone-sized screen for your testing, and, and make sure that everything is gonna fit within within a phone screen. Does that make sense? Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just all it is is changing the screen that you're using to visualize the changes you make. So you did inspect and then it took you to this page and then you just toggled between the images, right? Yeah, so I got a full page, right click, inspect, and then I can click this button to toggle between a desktop size and a phone size. Okay. Awesome, thank you. So it's, it's literally like, there's nothing inherently different about the code when you're, when you're programming for mobile versus desktop. The biggest difference is just what type of page are you using to test how your code looks. And when you do it this way, it's called mobile first programming. When you do it this way, it's called desktop first programming. Okay. Professor? Yes. Um, you said the bootstrap code that you initially used in the beginning is going to be found on the slides, right? Yes, it's found in the slides and I'll share those slides with you after this lecture. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you'll you. have that. I'm also going to share my GitHub repository so that you have my code. Okay, so so we should be, you should have all the code that you need to copy and paste um, to, to make your project look good. Um, the, the other thing is, let's try to work out any of the kinks with um, having Git on your computer and all that in the coming day or two so that we can decide. Because if you decide that you want to, do your project on something like um, Code Sandbox, which I'll just show you what that looks like real quick. So essentially this is my coding project. So I type here and then it shows up in this little screen. So this looks really nice and, and all of the projects did it on Code Sandbox last year but they just had certain issues with um, the, the way that it works uh, when a lot of people are on it at once. Sometimes it, it like slows down and all that. So the feedback that I got was that it would be better to just do everything on GitHub. So I'm trying to do that as primary and I, I wanna work with you very closely to make sure we get that right. Um, but if you need to just put all of your code on a code sandbox, perfectly okay, okay? So we'll work through that uh, in this coming week. So assignments um, start on JavaScript in Code Academy. I, I think you'll see that while it is definitely the most complex of the code the code formats that we're using, it's super powerful. And, and once you get used to it, you can do a lot of really cool things with it. Um, so. The expectation won't be to start incorporating JavaScript for, for a week or so, but um, I'd, I'd like you to focus on your page, on your prototype right now, on just the HTML and CSS, and then we can sprinkle in a little bit of nifty JavaScript um, as things start to finalize on your prototypes, okay? Um, and then I'd like you to user, user test your wireframe with, I'd say two to three, 
Um, you, you don't have to go all the way to five. This is just, I want you to get used to user testing. Um, and, and then you can fill out the rest of the five as you've actually built a prototype. Okay. Does that make sense? Great. All right, I'll stick around. Um, if anyone has any questions, you wanna work through some kinks, um, but I'll also be available via email. This is the hardest part. Once you get going with the code, it's not nearly as bad. It's always, and this is for me too, like when I, when I get a new computer, it's always a pain in the rear for me to have to set it up um, with Git and all, and all that. So it's not just you. It, this happens to me too. It, it's always a struggle, but once you're good, you're good. And then you've got that forever, right? That, that's not something that, that you can leverage for any app idea. You know, I, I mean, I've used it for visualizing car prices when we were car hunting, my wife and I. And, and, and there's just so many things you can do once you've got that ability to push code live, okay? All right, well, thanks so much. Um, that concludes the lecture. Great job, thanks for following along. I think your wireframes all looked great. Um, I'll have grades on those this week. And um, in terms of the, the prototypes, I have every confidence that you'll do a great job. All our students did a great job last year as well. Um, and, and I think it's just sort of getting through this first initial step. And I'm here for you to sort of give you some training wheels for that first week so that you can really thrive in the, the following weeks, okay? Thanks class, have a good night.